On Thursday, President Donald Trump arrived at Fulton County Jail to be arrested and booked on 13 felony counts for what is being described as an alleged scheme to overturn the results of the safest and most secure presidential election in history in the state of Georgia. And this will actually be the fourth time this year where he's turned himself in to be met with charges by state and federal officials. But this time it's a little different because they took his mugshot. Everybody else was smart enough to not do that, to make sure that that was not done because ostensibly they understood the power that that image would have. But for some reason, I don't know why, Fannie Willis was not smart enough to understand this. Perhaps she thought it would be a powerful demoralizing agent, another humiliation ritual, nagging in its ultimate form. That's understandable, but you look and already we're like a day or so into the fallout from the release of this image, and already people are angry, they're unified. The energy really does seem to have shifted in a way that I haven't felt for a very long time, and it's because of that image. And so we really do have to thank God for how stupid our enemies are, because they could have done this to Trump a hundred more times with no mugshot and Americans would have gotten marginally more upset and indignant, significantly more indifference, aloof, whatever, but they've instead chosen to provide us with really what is the most significant photograph ever taken in the history of the world. Like never has there been more at stake in a single photograph, and we will discuss exactly what that is along with a lot of other important points, which I don't expect anybody else to cover pertaining to both the near and distant future. Very important, exciting times, do stay tuned. John Doyle in. Heck off, Kami. Hello there, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to Heck Off, Kami. Let me just review my notes here briefly before we get started. Okay, uh, MAGA hat status on. Rubicon status crossed. Patriot status in control. Mass libtard suicide status imminent. You know, in true Trump fashion... I really do have to give myself some credit here. I was saying three years ago that these things would happen, and then since I've predicted the continued persecution, the indictments, the arrests, that the mugshot would end up being taken and that it would become the most significant photograph in history, in addition to an immediate and great fundraising tool for President Trump, but I said that all we needed was one. We just had to get lucky once. Eventually, one of these people would be so prideful, so resentful, so filled with bloodlust that they would commission this mugshot because their judgment had been clouded such that they believed that it would be, you know, like a humiliation demoralizing tool against Trump and his voters. But of course, the opposite has happened. And this is sort of the problem with being so ahead of the curve all the time. We've covered all of this already on so many occasions that when it finally comes true, I feel like I'm just repeating myself. But it's okay. I I really, I don't mind. But it is true that this is the most significant photo that's ever been taken. I don't know if I would go as far as to say it's the most significant image ever, but in the time since we've had photography, It's definitely the most significant picture that's ever been taken because you think about everything that's conveyed by that picture, everything that's at stake. You're talking about a truly like larger than life cultural figure, wildly successful businessman, virtually unchanging attitudes towards politics and all his years being a public figure. Yeah, when he actually started running, he has to come out and give a position on X, Y, Z. Okay, you have to play ball, but you go back 35 years, you listen to his interviews. He's basically saying that he wants the country to stop getting ripped off. He wants criminals to be put in jail and he wants to put America first, but he doesn't want to run, but he will if nobody else fixes it. Okay, so he runs, somehow he wins, he takes out the Bush political dynasty, the Clinton political dynasty, takes de jure control of the Republican party. Now gas goes under $2 a gallon, we're energy independent, we're not starting new wars, we're bringing jobs back, we're cutting immigration, there seems to be a sense of national pride, people are making more money, interest rates are at 3% or less, and it's like we just, we couldn't have that. And so our political system declares war on him, they fortify the election, we all all saw it happen. I will never forget that, watching the results come in for the rest of my life. He's taken Florida. Oh my, he's got Ohio already. New York Times odds, 80% Trump wins. And for the rest of my life, I will never forget, hey, they stopped counting in Georgia. They're going to bed. They're going to figure it out tomorrow. Like you just knew at that point that it was going to happen. Now they brag about it. Now they think it's funny. And they're putting people in jail for asking questions about that, including Donald Trump. So that's the story told in this picture. You take the greatest nation in history, you have its decline, the betrayal of its people by its rulers, a man who decides to try to reverse that decline, the sacrifices that he endures in pursuit of that. Finally, his arrest with directions to throw him in jail for hundreds of years. A trained eye can look at that and see virtually all of America's history, the old stock, its greatness, its decadence. It's cycle, it's place in the cyclical nature of history, declining empires, totalitarianism, the struggle of man against his enemies, those who threaten what he loves. All of that really is contained in that image. What's the line from Lenin? Like there are decades where nothing happens and there are weeks where decades happen. There are pictures worth a thousand words and there are pictures worth 
there are a thousand, there are pictures worth a thousand books. How about that? The picture is worth a thousand books. Shut up. Maybe the average person doesn't read that deeply into it, but it does resonate with people for that reason. Like we all understand intuitively what it means. And I think the left is starting to understand that as well and that they shouldn't have had this picture taken because now they're writing these think pieces about it desperately saying that, well, it was supposed to be an exercise in humility, but Trump made it into a threat because he looks, what, just pleased? Like, do you want him to look sad? Do you want him to look defeated? This is the problem with gynocracy and matriarchy. They literally think that they can basically like nag you into submission. They don't understand willpower. They don't understand fortitude or indifference. If they keep nagging you, you will eventually buckle. And of course it can't be, you know, well, he actually has legitimate grievances. He's rightfully angry. It has to be that his fragile male ego is just doubling down because he can't admit that he's wrong. And now he's trying to threaten us to get what he wants. They are so misaligned with reality and narcissism narcissistic. They can't comprehend the idea that they are incorrect. You take any narrative from the left, you just blur it a little bit. It sounds identical to women describing their past relationships. We're arresting you. Stand here, look at the camera. Fine. Oh my gosh, you're like threatening me right now. You're being really manipulative. Why can't you admit that you're wrong just for once in your life? I think that we're so used to admitting defeat over everything that when we start to actually get perceived victories, we get really unnecessarily skeptical about it. But these people aren't smart. They don't understand how warfare works at the top, maybe, sure. But the people who made the decision to have this picture taken, people like Fannie Willis, they are so used to being in power that they take it for granted, you know, the ability to defer to the science, the experts, the consensus, whatever. They really think that they should be able to basically nag you into non-existence. Like they just point at you, hey, he's bad. And then you just cease to exist. They don't understand honor. They only understand nagging. And if you're not buckling and apologizing, they just haven't nagged you enough. But also this whole nominal exercise in humility, that's just them getting off to this idea of like equality under the law, pretending that it's actually really good because it shows that we're all equal under the law and even the president will be held accountable. But obviously that's not true because if it were, then this could have happened to anyone. They would have done this to George Bush if he'd been trying to realign our political establishment and there's plenty of subject matter there, believe me. But it didn't because George Bush played ball. George Bush supported the wars for nothing. He supported the mass immigration. He supported the hollowing out of our country and of our culture. George Bush took the greatest amount of political capital and sense of unity that Republicans had ever seen or will ever see again, and he spent it on tax cuts. He spent it on the sand wars and the construction of a national security apparatus that would eventually be used to target the people who elected him in the first place. We could have deported every single illegal immigrant under the guise of, oh, we have to protect against potential terrorists. We could have built the border wall. We could have done anything we wanted. And his approval rating would have floored it like 80%. Perhaps the greatest traitor currently living to the American public. So because of that, he gets to hang out with everybody, right? He's in the club. Whereas if you give me a few hours of your time and an internet connection, I can construct a stronger case against pretty much any establishment politician, Republican or Democrat, whoever, than any of the counts they've levied against Trump. Because it's all out in the open, it's all publicly available, but nobody does anything about it. Because that's how the game is played. You go along with the agenda, you make your money on the side, do whatever else you're into on the side, but don't step out of line. And so anybody who supports or helps Trump in pretty much any capacity, it happens to them too. Think about all the other people who have faced criminal penalties for J6, but not the BLM riots, not Chaz, Antifa, similar events in DC or literally state capitals all throughout the country, nobody cares. It's not hypocrisy, it's not a double standard because we're not equal. The line that's being drawn isn't whether you've got membership in this party or that party. The line that's drawn is whether you are willing to go along with the regularly scheduled programming or if you are not. And when you view things through that lens, then it's all perfectly clear, it's all aligned. There's no incongruencies, no double standards, it all adds up perfectly, nice round number. People who aren't a threat can pretty much do whatever they want and people who are a threat will be persecuted no matter what they do. Not good. What is good? Glad you asked. Attention, patriots. Life is full of routines, some better than others. Sometimes you can make your day more enjoyable by changing something small, like wearing comfortable clothes. And for guys, it starts with your boxers. And that's why I started promoting our very good friends over at Undertack, the most comfortable pair of men's boxers I've ever worn. They're not normal boxers. Instead of being made with cotton, they're made with modal. It's kind of like cotton on steroids, 50% more moisture wicking, naturally antimicrobial. It stays in place. It's got this sturdy, comfortable 
comfortable, extra wide waistband, fly design, very straightforward. If you know, you know, it's durable, lightweight, fade resistant, shrink resistant. The best part, they're almost 30% less than the competition, folks. You gotta go pick up a whole drawer full, otherwise we're all literally going to die at undertack.com. Get 20% off site-wide when you use my offer code, DOYLE20. By the way, they donate a portion of their profits to veteran-run organizations that are actively fighting human trafficking, which we love, so take my advice. You have nothing to lose. It comes with a satisfaction guarantee, literally guaranteed satisfaction. I mean, like, come on. It's undertack.com. Undertack.com, offer code DOYLE20. Very epic. We continue. But yeah, people like to deny this, but Donald Trump is a threat, like, obviously. You know, no one's saying that Trump is going to save the world. I've never said that. No one's saying that it's over when Trump wins. However, it's still important because it happens to be true that Donald Trump does provide an opportunity to put this country on a better trajectory than it has right now, and especially when that's compared to wherever else we could be going in the future. You know, I know a lot of people in his circle. I've spoken to them. They're brilliant, and they are killers, and they want revenge. And you want to see what your post-Trump GOP is going to look like? You go watch the debate from the other night, which nobody's talking about, by the way. You know, that's actually, that's worth getting into. The same way that conservatism has been largely unable to define itself in practice apart from leftism because of its power, the GOP can't define itself apart from Donald Trump. No matter how hard they try, no matter what they do, Donald Trump is still in control. They can have their cute little democracy 2024 sign. Ultimately, though, they have to define themselves in terms set by Donald Trump, even if just in opposition to those terms in the first place. Because Donald Trump is the only person on the right in decades, not only to understand the importance, rather the necessity of media, but how to actually control it and set the narrative as opposed to just responding to a narrative set by your enemies. There's nobody else on the right who can do that. I wish there were because it's everything but there just isn't. Moreover, there's nothing that can replace that, meaning it's not like, oh, you know, we can just do this thing a little bit better and then that'll make up for us having virtually no narrative control or messaging power. That's obviously not true. Even ignoring that we are so incompetent that it's not like we have anybody in the first place who could even do that job well, assuming it even existed in the first place, right? Because the structure of our party is designed to elevate mediocre people with nothing behind their eyes. People who just want to masturbate to their self-image, go to the fun little after parties, smile for the photographs with every person they meet, by the way. Oh, let's get a photo. Oh, let's get a photo. They just want to LARP as political operatives, but ultimately they have no conviction. It's Hollywood for ugly people, as the saying goes. And because it's designed to elevate these types of people, consequently, we have no standing on our own. Think about it. How would you define the right if not for transsexuals behaving in the ways that they do? If I didn't have to hear every day about Dylan Mulvaney and Bud Light and Disney and Hunter Biden and whatever else is the outrage of the day, I wouldn't know what the right is because it has no self-concept. There's no real vision, no way forward, nothing that can independently exist. We're not a right wing. We're just this sort of like counter leftism. And I'm not saying that these issues aren't important, by the way, but they do highlight that we've had this problem for a very long time, which is the inability of the right to define find itself in its own terms. And what's worse is that when you try to do that, the biggest pushback you get is from those counter leftist types who will then try to police your behavior because maybe they're paid to, maybe they exist in the ecosystem just because they're that way naturally. It's probably both, but they come in, they're like, uh, yeah, this isn't it. Uh, how does that make us better than them? Uh, yikes. This is why I don't call myself a concert. Just grow up, please. Can you grow up? This is actually an under-discussed component of what drives people on our side to not like Trump, I think, because Trump actually does this. He actually does have a vision for what America should look like. A lot of people on our side, even some of our favorite pundits, they're very content with the regularly scheduled programming because maybe it's familiar to them. Maybe as conservative-leaning people, they're naturally averse to change. Maybe they're intimidated by greatness. Whatever it is, even if they're somewhat annoyed, yes, by the woke stuff— they seem to want to just continue supporting the class of people who do nothing but repackage the same platitudes about freedom and the Constitution, because maybe that makes them more comfortable than accepting that things have changed. Their country has changed. It was always going to change, but nobody ever thought it would change this terribly for the worse. Donald Trump is the only one who talks about building great new American cities, cleaning up our cities, making them safe again, getting rid of schizophrenic drug addicts, harassing people. What an embarrassment it is that American cities are something to be avoided now. We used to have the greatest cities in the world. Nations would define themselves by their great cities, and now we fled those cities as Democrats pick at the bones of our civilization. 
Also, having a long celebration of 250 years of American independence, building new statues, monuments, which again, these are the things that define civilizations. When you go visit an ancient civilization, you're not looking at their GDP records, you're not looking at their businesses, you're looking at their infrastructure, their monuments, how they express the soul of their civilization. Donald Trump does this. Nobody else can do it, which is a, really above else the biggest problem they have with Trump. Like He inspires people. He convinced tens of millions of Americans that their country can be made great again. That's the brilliance of MAGA. In the statement, Make America Great Again, is contained a handful of very important ideas. That America was great, that it's not anymore, but that it can be made great again because we are still here. That resonates with everybody. That's why when the left would try to deconstruct it, well, what, what do you mean? When was America ever great? Um, Source? It's like, you don't even get it. And this works perfectly, by the way, with the nature of political movements because every successful political movement has to have three things. It has to identify a better past state. It has to declare the present enemy, and it has to promise a better future. And the left does this because their whole view of history is basically, well, before patriarchy, before white people, we were in a state of nature and there was perfect equality. So once we get rid of patriarchy and whiteness in Europe, we can return to that communal, equal state of living. This is basically what these people believe. Their words, not mine. And the right kind of does this, not as successfully as the left though, because we say, and I understand the intro, okay? The irony, the sort of meta, self-referential, it's satire, okay? Leave me alone. But we say, okay, well, the 1950s were pretty good. Back then, people were trad. And, you know, the 18th century was pretty good as well. And if it weren't for big government and liberals being annoying, then we could have, you know, like, this multi-ethnic, racial, like, economics. I really, I don't even know what they're trying to sell us at this point is the future. But Trump actually does this well because he doesn't need to pin it to a time period necessarily. It's just that America was great, real. He identifies the globalists, the communists, the deep state, which maybe isn't a perfect encapsulation, but it's pretty close. Certainly a lot better than we had before. And he says that we can be great again. We will look and feel like America again. Our airports will be the global standard. Our cities, our jets, our economy, our cars, everything. Things that are real, things that inspire people. Because look, we're not going back to the 1950s. We're not going to jump into a Norman Rockwell painting like it's Mario 64. But there's probably nobody that had more fun in the latter half of the 20th century than Donald Trump. He understands the greatness that was lost, and he inspires people uniquely to take it back. He's the closest thing that we've produced in the last century to a great man of history. And we're so cynical. We're so demoralized. We pretend that's not the case. Ask yourself this, though. How many people will drop out of politics once Trump is done? We take this momentum for granted. We think it's going to stay. It's not. What is there that would compel these people to stay? There's simply nothing there for them. Look at the GOP debate the other night. People bitching about Ukraine, bitching about Israel, bitching about how if you want something done, you have to ask a woman. And I ask myself, when's the last time I saw a Chevrolet in Tokyo? Why is it that I can't go anywhere in public where it's crowded without feeling like I'm in a third world country? Of course, there's nothing on that stage that inspires people because it's all fake. There is no greater display of public group masturbation than a GOP debate. It would actually be more honest in a way if that's what they did, like literally speaking, there would be more dignity in that. And you look at the people not even on stage and they're already trying to ruin this. The Trump mugshot comes out and they're immediately like, okay guys, this is our chance to flip the black vote. And you think it's a joke, but then they explain their argument, which is that black people will relate to the experience of being unfairly persecuted by the criminal justice system. Can we just stay focused for like five minutes, please? Like these people get called racist once by a relative. They spend the rest of their lives trying to disprove it. It's like they're robots that are programmed to lose. They see something happen and they're like, okay, but how does this help us lose? They're like the Gorgonites. Remember small soldiers? But we have to lose, but we must snatch defeat from the jaws of victory. But sir, isn't it true that systemic racism plagues our justice system? No, I'm with the commando elite. You guys suck. You're just a toy. You don't get it. Link static communications awaiting dispatch of the uniform crime report, sir. It's going to be so over for you guys. Figure it out. Get with the program. Do you understand what time it is? Can you read the room? Your entire political system is fake. It's not real. It's not a matter of, oh, we just got to get the right guy, someone without baggage. The sooner you can digest that and stop trying to think of ways to rationalize your denial of that, the better off we'll all be. And this is the same kind of cynicism we were talking about earlier. And you notice that it's all over the board. Everyone's just <laughs> believing in stuff. is It's cringe. And it's like, okay, look, I have a deep appreciation for greatness and for excellence. It inspires me. I have a respect and an admiration for great men. Everyone else throughout history has as well. And our culture likes to take this impulse and channel it into things like superhero movies or some other dead end because greatness inspires people. I don't care 
in the absence of that. I'm not one of these people who's going to take my favorite politician and make an epic edit of them with laser eyes for legislating common good originalism and put that as like my profile picture. I don't care about politicians. That's not what this is about. And if you can't perceive that difference, you're just not going to make it. Like we're literally back. Donald Trump is back on Twitter. And you know, obviously I'm a big supporter of his, but you can't deny the guy just has an unmatched instinct for branding and controlling narratives because now his return to Twitter is a bigger story than even the indictment. And since you asked, yes, I also predicted the return to Twitter, which Elon Musk enthusiastically retweeted. I am literally so vindicated on long-term predictions, which maybe they necessarily have to be long-term since I post infrequently. Okay. Touche. But I've had the Elon Musk sticker, you know, on my laptop since I started. And people were like, oh, EVs are the tools of the socialists, this, this, and that. And I always thought, you know, I don't know. There's something about the guy that I like. And then he buys Twitter and he brings me back. Ron DeSantis. I called that over two years ago when everybody, everybody was hot on this guy. And now it's a mainstream talking point. Virtually every point that I raised came true. And honestly, really, if I'm being sincere, I just feel bad for the guy at this point. I mean, think about it. Donald Trump has been arrested for like the 10th time, but it's actually still more embarrassing to be Ron DeSantis right now. How does that even work? I mean, imagine running for president and your biggest opponent gets indicted, arrested again, and somehow it's still worse to be you. Not good. Uh, Vivek Ramaswamy, you know, I was actually, I was working on a video about him before this happened. I've got a lot to say, but for now, I'll just say he's very impressive. Good on a lot of the issues, certainly better than the majority of people he shared a stage with the other night, but still hope everybody hears me out in the next video and people say, oh, well, you're just going to go after anybody that challenges Trump. Like maybe, I don't know, that's, that's like a less honest way of saying that I'll go after anybody who isn't as good as Donald Trump. You know, I've been supporting Trump since 2015. I like to play the footage of the rally, you know, with me there that he used in 2016 for the commercials, but till we've got a better option, I will continue to do so. It wasn't popular then, it became popular. It was popular when I started working in politics, lost favor for a couple years after 2020. People were heavily trending towards Ron DeSantis or other people. Now they rediscover reasons to support Trump. And a lot of them right now are trying to sell you a t-shirt with his mugshot on it. Cool. You know, if you want one, go to the official campaign website. Buy one there. That way you're actually supporting Trump in his campaign and not people who never really did support Trump at all. I bought a couple. And you really can't have a better design. You know, you can try to make it edgier, more like t-shirt friendly, so to speak, but you're only perverting it. You're never going to make the image itself better. You can make it into a meme, but people aren't doing that. They're like trying to improve the image itself and make it into like a caricature of what they think a mugshot should look like. But the design too is really just like classic Trump, you know, simple, straight to the point. You know, we think of the MAGA hat now as iconic. That was literally just Trump being like, hey, let's have a red hat. And then it's going to have text on it that says, make America great again. And it became iconic iconic because it was Donald Trump's and he sets the trends literally like who cares what else is going on right now Donald Trump is the main character play your part stop blackpilling it's so over it's controlled opposition it's all the same when we win we are going to sacrifice you to the great fish at the Bass Pro Shops Pyramid in Memphis for having insufficient Patriot points. Get a grip, man. Think about the future. Think about what's on the horizon for us. When this is all over, do you understand how much fun it's going to be humiliating these people back? Statues of controversial American heroes, new federal holidays, the art of the deal now required reading for a K-12 education. Normal people will just shrug it off. You know, what's the big deal? Just like they didn't really care about Juneteenth or the rewriting of our history or our statues coming down. But we will understand the significance of it. And more importantly, our enemies will. The richest man in the world bought Twitter, brought Trump back, a bunch of very smart people back. Then he calls Trump's like return tweet next level. And you're black pilled right now. That's your prerogative. But there are tens of millions of people who will never forget what they did to our president and what they've done to our country. The bad guys are literally like a coalition of retarded perverts. They're only held together by their hatred for us. Our side has everything except basically willpower. And this photograph can help give that to them. We're in a very fortunate position because we have the enemies that we do. Because once we get organized, it's literally over for them. And they know that, by the way, because they can only exist in chaos and disorder and confusion, partially because that keeps us in confusion and chaos. We don't know what we're doing. We don't know who's with who, et cetera, et cetera. That's why most of their efforts at the tactical level are in demoralizing you, neutering you, distracting, sowing division, et cetera. But once we become a serious movement for serious people, everybody finds each other, it's literally over for them. So why would you black pill in the meantime? 
What, are you sad or something? Are you going to cry? Are you going to kill yourself? Understand, you are a part of a tradition of non-surrender, a tradition that says never die. You exist at this time for a purpose. The left believes that life has ultimately no purpose except for, yeah, you know, maybe deriving a sense of pleasure in the meantime from trying to destroy us and our lives. Misery loves company. It is what it is. But we understand that life's purpose is to keep moving forward, always forward, conquest, perseverance. These are the impulses in your brain. More importantly, in your soul, they've tried to cloud those impulses with chemicals and endocrine disruptors and pornography and drugs and everything else, but they are still there and they can still be channeled forward. And so never surrender. Hey guys, if you like this video, leave it a thumbs up, leave it a comment, subscribe to the channel, turn on post notifications, and of course, share the video with a friend. We love that, arguably the, nah, but we love it, okay? Uh, did you enjoy that? Did you have a nice time? Just some classic hawk content, some classic hawk tent, get you in and out, on your way. I don't know how long we went for. I told myself we'll go for 18 minutes, just quick, quick video, no hour long treatise on a particular topic, but did get a little bit sidetracked there, though we don't regret it. It was a good video, hit on a lot of good topics. And of course we had to, you know, President Trump, he visited me in a dream and it was revealed to me that I was to make a video on this topic or be deducted 10,000 Patriot points and I said, yes, sir, Mr. President, I'll take care of it. So here we are. But uh, yes, thank you for watching. May God bless America.